Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to Broadway Comedy Club Radio. This podcast has been on hiatus for almost two years, and I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, joined, as always, by the owner of Broadway Comedy Club itself. Uh, for what it's worth these days, as the doors have been closed since March, but coming to you from New York City, I'm Clayton Fletcher, and I'm joined by my esteemed co-host and dear friend, uh, from parts unknown somewhere in the southern part of the United States, Al Martin. Al, how have you been? Oh, Clayton, I've been just lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Business is booming, right? Business is booming. Um, <laughs> listen, I've gotten an idea a little bit about what retirement could be like. And I'm really nauseous, you know. I really need to. Get, I really need to get back to work, you know. I'm doing stupid crap like food reviews and uh, <laughs> you know stuff like that. I did get a chance to write a book uh, during our time off, uh, which was a lot of fun and something I had always wanted to do. And uh, then I got the idea of uh, let's bring back the band and uh, get back here doing a podcast. Well, I was so happy to hear from you and you gave me a call and you said, look, it's been a long time since we did an episode and we now have uh, this young man that you're introducing me to today. Jay is uh, our producer, our new producer, Jay, and uh, he has a great setup so that we can start bringing these episodes uh, virtually. So Al and I used to have to meet in person in a studio and no offense, Al, but I, I don't want to meet anyone these days with all the uh, infectious diseases that are going around. So uh, I'm very thankful that we are able to do this again. And Al, you're what's known as a high energy person. Is that, do you think that's fair? Oh, are you talking to me? No. Uh, yes, I, I, I am high energy. You know, I'm, I might look uh, like, uh, you know, a big slumbering person, but I like to keep myself busy. I like to always explore new things um, and get myself involved in a lot of new things uh, to keep the brain going. And uh, I think that's a lot like our guest that we have coming up on the show today. Yeah, so we want to hear what you've been doing uh, throughout the quarantine, of course, Al. But uh, I, I also, and I, of course, we want to hear all about your new book, which I think a lot of our listeners will definitely want to get their hands on. But before we do that, I. I wanted to ask you if you would kindly introduce all of our listeners, all of our viewers, since we're also doing a video podcast, although no one can see me <laughs> with my current setup. We'll fix that for next for the next episode. But Al, please uh, take a moment here and introduce everyone to our special guest today. Yes, our, our special guest, I met him, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago uh, the, when the Comedy Cellar was doing a podcast with the owners, they, they do like a yearly thing of the owners in comedy. And I think um, he was on that episode. And then I, uh, you know, via my eye in the sky uh, cameras, I, I check in every night at the club and I noticed he was performing a lot um, uh, at the uh, Broadway uh, Comedy Club. And, um, you know, just started reading and hearing a lot about him. And then he really broke out on the radar uh, just recently when he um, made some comments about New York. Um, and Jerry Seinfeld took it the wrong way. The comments were basically like, uh, New York right now is dead, you know. I, I think, paraphrasing, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but New York for now is just not going anywhere uh everything is shut down um the crime is rising and jerry seinfeld you know took uh, umbrage with it and it, it became a pretty hot topic for a few days and you know as a business person reading what our guest said you know i thought made a lot of sense from a business standpoint i think that jerry seinfeld not to get into his head but I think he was reacting from an emotional uh, mindset. And I think those two things don't always meet and match, you know. And uh, But let's, let's have our guest talk a little bit about all this stuff. I'd like to introduce him. He's a stand-up comic, uh, a very successful entrepreneur, 
and um, uh, owner of a comedy club here in New York City as well. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome James Altushar. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, that's good enough. And Al and Clay, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Honored to have you. Yeah, all you have to do if you want to get on our podcast is pick a fight with Jerry Seinfeld. So. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> me. I did not intend to do that, but uh, unfortunately, it happened, and it's it, it's been four months now of Jerry just uh, accusing me of not having grit, not being a real New Yorker. Uh, they they took his article, which was a response to mine, and they blew it up to the size of an entire building. And you can see it. I think it's on 80th and Madison. It like covers an entire building. His article. Yeah. You know, and basically, when he talks about having grit of a real New Yorker, um, he's basically spends his time uh, in the Hamptons, doesn't he? Uh, I don't know <laughs> if that's the true grit. And he's from Massapequa, I believe, Long Island. So it's not like he was growing up in the 70s in the streets of New York like I was, or you know, uh, Tracy Morgan might have been, or Mike Tyson in Bed Stuy. You know, he he pretty much grew up in the suburbs, and uh, I don't I don't know if he's really aware of everything going on, on uh, especially uh, in the Upper West Side with some of the problems they had. Yeah, and like and look, I respect his opinion, and and it it reflects the opinion of a lot of people. They a lot of people I think are in denial, or they were. I wrote this article in August. And the reason I wrote it is because I do, like all of us, I love New York. I don't want to see it it have problems. But I felt people, everybody I was talking to was in denial. Like, oh, as soon as we get a vaccine, everything will be okay. Well, something like 90% of restaurants might never reopen after this latest lockdown is over. About right. one third of small businesses, about 80,000 small businesses might already be bankrupt in New York about a half a million people have already moved out of New York. This is the biggest flight out of New York City ever. And buildings that normally would be, you know, at least 50% full, even with, uh, you know, the social distancing and everything are only 5% full now. So there's, I could go on and on, but there's serious problems that are going to affect the revenues of New York City, which ref which will affect the services New York City offers, which in turn affects how many people and businesses want to move to New York City, which, you know, then it's a cycle and that affects the taxes paid and so on. It repeats itself. Absolutely. I, I, I agree completely. And as, as I was saying to Clayton before, I think, you know, I think Jerry Seinfeld might have been dealing from an emotional standpoint, hearing what he felt was his hometown being attacked when really you were talking as a business person and dollar and cents, and it makes complete sense. And I've been saying this for quite a while, New York City and New York State have not been collecting a lot of sales tax over the last uh, nine months. Uh, the uh, landlords, I'm sure, are having trouble making their tax payments. As a matter of fact, the landlord on one of my uh, clubs, just got a tax increase, you know, which is quite amazing. And well, then people, you know, people aren't spending money, so sales taxes are down all over the place. So, yeah, there's going to come a time. At, and this is why I think in this election, when Nancy Pelosi was arguing for the bailouts of state and federal, I mean, not federal, but state bailouts of certain cities, you know, it was as a result of because that, you know, that these cities and municipalities because of these draconian lockdowns have not been collecting a lot of revenue. No, and, and the problem a little bit with a state bailout is, let's say they allocate a trillion dollars to the states, which sounds like a huge number. And let's say they decide New York State is worthy of double the average, you know, so so instead of 50, you know, instead of 20 billion, they give New York State 40 billion. Well, New York State is 30 billion dollars in the hole. So how much is left over for just New York City? New York City by itself is probably 50 to 100 billion dollars in the hole. And I'm, I'm thinking forward in 2021 when they finally see the, the lack of income taxes, property taxes and so on and all the bankruptcies. I don't know. You can't bail out. You can't make the bailout big enough to help New York City. And I even called people in the government. I said, how about the Federal Reserve 
uh, you know, buys New York City municipal bonds because the Federal Reserve is trying to increase inflation right now. And I, I spoke to someone at the Federal Reserve and they said, no, we can't do that because then Tulsa, Oklahoma or Kansas City will get upset. You can't single out one city, even if it's New York City. Yeah, I think that uh, they're hoping for a Hail Mary bailout. And it's amazing. It's, they either have the New York State and New York City controller locked up and his mouth gagged and handcuffed in some dungeon somewhere, or these guys have really kind of breached their fiduciary responsibility because nobody's talking about what you and I have been discussing and you've been blowing the horn on it. And You, you know, I even spoke to um, uh, one of the mayoral candidates that the mayoral race in New York City is heating up and, you know, nobody has a solution. Everybody is just like, well, you know, over the long run, New York City survives and, you know, you'd be surprised. New Yorkers do want to pay more taxes to help their city. And I'm like, well, I'm a New Yorker. I don't want to pay more taxes, you know, and then particularly on top of the state taxes in New York State. And yeah. and also, it's not as if, let's say 8,000 restaurants closed down, and it's probably going to be much more. It's 8,000 as of today, but it's going to be much more in, in two months. It's not like anybody's going to wake up and say, boy, finally I can achieve my lifelong dream of starting a pizza restaurant in New York. No one's going to do that. You just watched 8,000 8, restaurants close down. It's not like everyone's eager to go in into a swamp where they're going to sink like everybody else before them. And the same thing with Broadway. Who's going to fund the next wave? Who's going to invest in the next wave of Broadway shows? And I don't even like Broadway, but I do want the, the thousands of restaurants and hotels and other businesses that are around that ecosystem to survive. That's a half a million employees. So and that's my neighborhood, you know, yeah. so I'm, I live on 42nd Street, so I'm right in the middle of all of that. I mean, this is all this is all anyone needs to know. Like you're from New York, Al's from New York, and I'm from New York. You guys are in Florida. I'm the last man standing here right. in, in Manhattan. Uh, and I don't I don't blame you. I mean, it, there's nothing like December, January, February in New York City with no restaurants to go to. So uh, you guys are the smart ones. Here. Well, I, I stayed March, April, May, June. But then when things looked like they were going to clear up a little, that's when you started seeing more violence, more, you know, a, 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 a huge, I mean, there's something like a 200% uptick in, in murders in the city. And it's scary. I have a family and, you know, we decided to take off for a while and we've continued that. You don't have to even Absolutely, apologize. And I, I don't that you. is your first role to protect your family. And anybody, you know, everybody's got a lot of opinions when they're not in the situation that a person might be in. You know, I mean, there. You know, I made the evaluate. I usually come back from Florida in May, and I never came back until July because I started thinking about it. What am I coming back to? They're not going to. There was a little brief hope, but then that just all petered away. Um, and so there was no hope I was going to be needed to be back in town to open my businesses. So what am I doing? I might as well enjoy the pool here, enjoy the beach, um, and um, enjoy some kind of life down here. In New York, it just seemed very, very draconian and even unsafe, some of these lockdowns. I and mean... Uh, yeah, no, unsafe is a is a very interesting thing which we can we can get to. But but Al and, and Clay also, what I'm seeing even in in the Miami comedy scene, there used to be no comedy scene in Miami. But now a lot of the comedians have moved from L.A., have moved from New York, are here, and I'm starting to see a, a burgeoning comedy scene. And I think th my point there is the second and third tier cities in the U.S. are actually benefiting right now from the flight of a half a million people from New York City, you know, another hundreds of thousands from San Francisco, LA, Chicago, like places like Nashville, Charlotte, Miami, Dallas, Austin, Salt Lake City, Las Vegas. These places are gonna benefit as money Absolutely. and people f f flee New York. And that's exactly what's happening. Real estate prices have been going up in Southern Florida. Absolutely, you know, um, it, 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 well, go ahead, Clayton, you were gonna say something? Clayton? Well, I was just going to say, James, it sounds like, you know, with you guys uh, are both kind of expressing a lot of doom and gloom <laughs> about New York right now. And I'm wondering if, you know, the point of your article, it sounds to me, James, like you, you stand by 
your words in that article, regardless of how Jerry Seinfeld may have reacted or well, anyone else that said New York is not dead, it seems to me like you stand by what you said and you really feel like there is a death here in the city. Well, well, only because so I wrote this article August 13th and something like my estimates now, just from viewing all the analytics, about 30 million people have read this article and the data has actually gotten worse since August 13th. Like there are more people who have left New York City. There are more restaurants and businesses and draconian regulations put in place. There are more, there's one in four New Yorkers have not paid rent since March. There's over $2 billion in rent owed that's never going to get paid. It's not like someone was fired and is suddenly gonna come up with 10 months worth of rent when the rent moratorium is, is over. So yeah, I think, and, and again, this is not a, I'm not trying to bash New York. I want to help it. And so my disappointment with Jerry is that obviously he cares about New York, but he's actually never written an article in his life until this moment. And he didn't, you know, again, as much as I appreciate his opinion and his love for the city, you're right, Al, he's spent the entire lockdown outside of New York City. So maybe he's not aware of what's going on. I appreciate his love for the city, but He's never written an article before. He didn't really know how to express his opinion. All he did was attack me for the entire article and not make any other points or address any of the issues. Yeah, and I, you know, a lot of people have come to me and they say, well, you know, there are a lot of good opportunities in New York right now for, um, you know, o opening a business again or a club. You can get much cheaper rents on new spaces. And uh, my thought to that is, honestly, and this is to your earlier point about people investing in other areas, you know, the first thing I said, I turned around to my wife and I said, you know, after we were away from the people that were saying this, you know, I said, you know what, I really have to take into consideration investing in anything, exactly what kind of city or state am I investing? Like, I never want to go through this again. And, you know, like I was involved in buying a commercial piece of property here and the realtor said to me, oh, this used to be a great restaurant, but there's a hospital a couple of blocks away and it's sort of becoming like a doctor's row. And I said to him right away, well, if I would buy this, I would not put a restaurant in here because even in the best of times, restaurants go up the toilet bowl, but, a medical facility is going to be involved in an essential service no matter what. It's always going to be pretty much essential. So these are the decisions we all have to make. Are we going to invest in the future in a place that is not, and it's not only with the pandemic. New York City, if you look at the city council and what happened to Amazon, this is a city that is you know, I get letters all the time from various cities and states that are offering all sorts of tax breaks, you know, to bring business in and they want to develop business. I have never seen a city like New York that is so involved in discouraging business from opening up here. So it, it, It's kind of amazing because, and not, not to get too wonky here, but one big problem in New York City now, which, which I've realized recently and, and, and didn't mention in the original article, was that people now, and this is not just New York City, it's all over the country, but particularly in New York City, people have become addicted to Amazon because you can't go out. And well, during the lockdowns, you couldn't go out and go to the local deli and buy you know, basic needs. You had to go to Amazon. And there's a, there's a kind of um, subtle problem with that, which is that typically when you get paid, when anybody gets paid who lives in New York City, they spend part of that money locally and then the people they spent, like you buy a newspaper at the newspaper stand, the newspaper guy buys a pack of cigarettes at the deli, the deli guy does his laundry at the local laundromat. And so $1 gets passed around the community five to 10 times. That's called the, the velocity of money. And that increases the prosperity of a city that has all the services and benefits that New York City does. But if you get paid a dollar and it goes straight to Seattle because you bought something from Amazon, the prosperity of the city goes way down because the money immediately flees the community. And this is a problem that we're not going to realize for another six to 12 months that how, how, how bad the velocity of money has become in New York City. That, that's another problem with these lockdowns that nobody has taken into account. I haven't seen it written about anywhere. 
No, it's ve it's very true, and it's it's just amazing to me how many people are in power uh, in New York that have no idea of this con. It's like I, I think their hail mary pass in New York was to get a bailout. You know, get all three. You know, the Senate, the House, and the presidency, and then just a massive bailout for the big cities. That right, was their, with, the game plan. And again, I don't know how the math even works there. Like, if you give New York State forty billion, well, the MTA by itself, you know, the the Transit Authority, they need about twenty billion. They're losing two hundred million dollars a week now. Yeah. And what do you, what are you going to do? So what's happening is, you know, you're forced. New York City's forced to fire essential workers like the emt workers who are the front lines of the covid they're going to get fired trash collectors are getting fired there's trash all over new york city police are getting fired teachers are getting fired firemen are getting fired so again if you don't have money you have to re reduce services you have to fire people and it's really sad like you know the title of my article my original article was new york city is dead forever and everyone questioned the forever but if you were fired yesterday forever was yesterday <laughs> Like it's it's not it's not pleasant, you know. Chronic unemployment leads to massive depression and and you know all sorts of other things. Your immune system breaks down. It's 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 not it's not going to be easy what we're heading into. But I do think the second and third tier cities have a little bit more of a chance than New York City right now. Uh, I agree. I, I think that wow, this it, whole it, conversation it, is giving. Well, you see, Clayton, that's just exactly the point that you know you can either get this you can either get your cereal you know the way you uh, the way it should be to you with healthy fruits and 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 skim milk or whatever that will keep you living a long time or we can all live in fantasy land and say hey you know a, a diet of all hot dogs and and and, and uh, you know uh, um, captain crunch you know and all and with regular whole milk is good for everybody you know he's james is really kind of telling you like it is and and i you know i study these things too and i don't see any way out of it for quite a while you know uh, you know the only possible way out of it is um to go in that same dungeon where the uh, the two controllers for the city and the state of new york are locked up and put a guy in there with a money printing machine and sit there all day and just print a lot of money, which will be worthless in a while. And uh, we all saw what happened to Germany uh, in uh, the 1920s when when it took an entire wheelbarrow of money to buy a chocolate bar. So we're, we're heading to some trouble in New York. I, now, I, I, I see us coming. Al, Al for, for, for Clay's benefit, I'll play the devil's advocate a little bit. Here's the, one of the arguments I got, and I and I, I know you'll have a, an interesting response having grown up here, but a lot of people said, okay, well, New York City will return to the utopia, the artistic utopia it was in the 70s when rents were cheap and there was a lot of art and culture. Uh, maybe, maybe address that argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know Clayton likes to keep the language on this podcast clean. But New York was a blank hole years ago in the <laughs> 70s. There was graffiti all over the train. Just to give you an idea, I think uh, in last year's statistics, pre-COVID, the, the, the murder rate in New York was somewhere between two and 500 people a year or something like that. It was very low. When I was growing up, the murder rate was 2,000 plus people a year. Uh, Real estate was tumbling. Um, you know, uh, it, it, I used to go to a Yankee game on the subway, and my mom always taught me sit in the in the conductor's car or in the front car. Don't be walking anywhere else because you just don't know who's going to. You you'd be on a train station, and twelve gang members would get on the train, and and you're trapped. So it was it, scary. The, the, yeah, there was squeegee guys, you know, homeless. You know, I just saw a video from a friend of mine in Venice Beach, California. There's an entire, along the beach, homeless encampments with tents. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure they'll be 
the government there will be running uh, hot and cold water for the people too. It's crazy what's going on. Right. That's just it. It was not a utopia. It was it was bad, and that that's why you know those those mayors that were around then, like a beam. No one remembers him because he was like maybe the worst mayor in New York City history. <laughs> but yeah. but let's let's cheer Clay up. Let's we got to find some some light here. Like uh, yes, things will be cheaper <laughs> at some point, and also I guess. Uh, young pe a lot of young people will move in, but, you know, even though there won't be that many as many jobs for them, you will have young people moving into the, the cheaper apartments, so there'll be more people to meet, and and that might create some excitement. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of anything else. Clay, you're gonna have to visit here. Yeah, it's, it's well, here's really... the problem you have. Yeah, here's the problem you have in New York. Crime is really skyrocketing. You are not allowed to legally. It's very difficult you know, to get a gun permit in New York to protect yourself. And the police have been so battered, they're hesitant to get involved in a lot of things. So basically, if you're a citizen of New York, you're walking around a sitting duck. Yeah, the, the police are official. They're not, uh, are unofficially, they're not going to okay, work. Okay, so that's Al. That's right, so it seems like we're really struggling here to find any type of silver lining i love how james says hey, let's find the silver lining and we end with al saying i'm going to get shot i'm just <laughs> not going to renew my lease i think i, I just decided <laughs> it's not well you're, you're lucky you're renting well, let me ask you guys since i have an opportunity to speak yeah right exactly you know because the, the ones who own that they're not going to get anywhere near market value uh from from the sounds of it but since i have two comedy club owners here on the podcast, uh, what do you see with all this doom and gloom you guys are, are saying? And I, by the way, I don't disagree. Things are really rough here in New York, and I, I you know, I'm I'm more on James's side than Jerry's, just for the record. Uh, but yeah, I, I am still here. Uh, but you know, what? How do you see things turning out for your businesses? Al, you own two comedy clubs, and James, let me start with you. You know, you're part owner of of Stand Up New York, one of the legendary clubs here in New York City, Upper West Side. Uh, what do you see happening in the next? You know, the, the, there's a vaccine, right? Supposedly we're all going to start getting vaccinated and things are going to get back to quote unquote normal. Do you see your business surviving this? What do you think? It's a good question because I think everybody's got to be creative now about what their business is. So for instance, Stand Up New York's been doing shows in the parks outdoors where, where we've been able to collect donations. And we've also been doing shows in religious uh, buildings like churches and synagogues to because those are, are open. And so, you know, and then the, the by the way, the PPP loans and the disaster relief were, were very were very good for us. Like those those did actually help a lot of small businesses, although some small businesses it didn't help, but but for us it, it did. So I don't know, it depends on the next stimulus package and it depends on how we pivot the, the business. Like take a company like Abercrombie and Fitch that makes clothes, obviously. They pivoted to just make uh you know PPE, like you know, surgical gowns and masks and things like that. So everybody kinda has to rethink their business a little bit and, and get creative. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's you know, you come with that co competitive force, there are less people in New York City. So, but right as officially now, there's only one or two less comedy clubs. So you still have a lot of comedy clubs with competing for less people. And the tourism business is just not gonna be there for quite a while, which right off the bat could be 40%, you know, and Broadway may be a little bit more than stand up New York because we're right in the middle of that. So you you really, and then I don't see this city opening up at 100% capacity off the bat. So now you're opening at anywhere between 25 to 50% capacity with um, probably 10, you know, 5% less people. Uh, you have a population, and I gotta tell you that like, the mentality of the people in Florida is very different than the mentality of the people in New York, and that's for better or worse. But people in New York in, in those early months must have been shell-shocked as to what they saw or what they were told was going on 
because when I came back from Florida into New York, the level of paranoia w was unbelievable. I mean, just unbelievable. And now in Florida, certain sections, they can use a little more paranoia. I got to be very honest, but it's, you know, people are walking around down here. Some of them, you wouldn't even think they knew there was a pandemic going on. So it's going to take a lot of training for certain people to decide to go out again. On the other hand, I do think there's some pent up demand that people are going to want to get out and, and start to feel normal, uh, especially with the vaccine. So, you know, I, I, I see all of next year, 2021, at some point being allowed to reopen and then like sort of stumbling for the second half of the year and, you know, maybe get our, get our feet going somewhere in 2022. You know, but for a person like me, you know, well, we just have a... so it's like uh, the clock. I don't have a lot of uh, right. these years left to be, you know, thinking about a 10 year plan, you know. Well, and, and let me ask you this. Like, I think culture is <laughs> right. shifting a little. Right. I think culture is shifting a little bit, too. Like down here in, in South Florida, I've done five or six comedy shows. Only one has been in a club in the in the palm beach improv and uh the rest were in bars or in outdoor spaces or things that are being you know transformed into being you know uh uh you know sometimes it's a bar sometimes there's comedy shows sometimes there's music events so i think people are being a lot more flexible about spaces and you know another question is what will be the need for specific comedy clubs uh, going forward, as opposed to people just organizing their own shows in, in bars or, or, again, outdoor spaces and so on. I did a show last night uh, in a nice big outdoor space, and there was five comedians, uh, all of them except one from either New York or L.A. Yeah, I, I think... Um, yeah, that's the new normal, I guess. I, I still kind of think once we're back to some semblance of normal indoor comedy clubs, especially New York, Florida's got the advantage of pretty much year-round decent weather. But in New York, you know, this idiocy idea of outdoor dining in December, January, and February, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, is one reason why indoor places at at least six months of the year will do just fine at some point. Um, and as far as the rest of the year, you know, some people don't like it when it's hot and humid. They want to be indoors in a nice air conditioned place. So I think at some point we will get back there. And because it's to me, there's nothing more exciting. And maybe I'm just old school or old fashioned. There's nothing more exciting than, you know, a, a low ceiling and, and um, you know, a packed comedy club, you know, but, you know, where there's no COVID floating around, that it would it is incredible. You don't get that in a park. You don't get that in in other type of, of venues. You get that laughter bouncing off the tiles, hitting the ceiling, and in an, in an, an enclosed area. It's just to me as a comedian, nothing like it. I believe that comedy in a comedy club comedy doesn't work as well anywhere else you know outside on a rooftop uh in the park is fine but even like a giant theater like sometimes you see comedians record their their specials in like a 5000 seat theater there's nothing like the comedy club environment as far as uh really being able to connect with an audience and have an audience uh have a have a personality of its own if you will i think there becomes like a group mentality that you want to create and it's just very hard to do that outside of the comedy club setting so i agree with al it will come back sooner or later um and yeah james your point on that yeah just uh, nothing beats a, a feeling like in al's club the, the greenwich comedy club uh it's so packed in when when it when it's full it's so packed in with people that it's it's like every laugh turns into viral laughter. It's a, it's such an incredible pleasure to to perform there. Same with Clay, with Clay with the New York Comedy Club. Like it's they fit in so many people. It's a, it's a it's a great feeling. Like laughter goes viral. It's a the ceilings are low, so the laughter is bouncing off all the walls very easily. And uh, you know, comedy clubs are made for comedy, and and they're fun to perform yeah. at. 
Yeah. You know, James, I have one interesting yeah. question. Um, so you, you've been involved, obviously, in the, in, the, in the financial markets. And looking at the stock market today, and I know there's, you know, buy on the rumor, sell on the news, it's forward looking or whatever, but what the hell is going on? You and I are seeing one thing with the economy, and Wall Street is seeing something else, I think. Well, it's not quite that Wall Street's seeing something else. It's just that most of the market, the way you measure the market is you look at it, is the S&P 500 going up or down? Well, the S&P 500 is weighted so that the, the biggest companies have the most influence. So yes, Amazon, Apple, Zoom, Microsoft, these Intel, these companies are doing great right now. Starbucks, think about Starbucks. Okay, in between my apartment in New York City and the first Starbucks, there are three mom and pop cafes. Well, they have all shut down and Starbucks is, you know, has a lot of money, is is a big company. They're they're open. So actually the competition for these big companies is going away. So the stocks, the companies are making more profits, the stocks are going up. It's actually the, the market is is reasonable right now because it favors the big companies and it doesn't and it ignores the fact that all these small companies that aren't on the stock market are going out of business. It's actually good for the stock market in a weird way that all the non stock market companies are failing right now. I I could give you the one definite tip on the when same to point that you market. made earlier about Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, money's going straight to Starbucks or or Zoom. We're on we're on Zoom right now instead of you know meeting in person. Right. The one definite tip I can give you on um, on uh, shorting the market is when comedians start walking over to you and they say, "James, I just bought my first stocks. You're at a top. Sell on Monday. Get yeah. out of the market." When comedians are giving you stock tips. <laughs> That's, That's the true. time to get out. I got really nervous in, in 2018 when a lot of comedians were coming up to me and saying, hey, I just bought Bitcoin. And I'm like, oh, no, please yeah. don't do a, a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, That's a definite reason to get well, out. And talking we about have to, getting uh, out, I think our time is almost up, Clayton, no? Yeah, I was just about to say, Al, we are running short of time. And I wanted to make sure that uh, you, you get at least a minute or two here to plug your book. Tell us about the book. You took some time during the pandemic to actually do something that a lot of people say they're going to do in their lifetimes and they never get around yeah, to it. it. You it, actually wrote a book. So please tell us all about yeah. it. It's based on uh, 30 years in comedy. It's called Did It on a Dare, How I Built the Comedy Empire in 30 Short Years. <laughs> and the sequel will be how COVID ruined it in six months or less. You know? <laughs> but uh, it, it really was something of stories that I've been keeping for years and years uh, in my head and jotting them down and, you know, having a lot of time during the pandemic. Uh, that's when I took uh, the time to write it. And my wife also wrote a great book. She found her... Um, uh, oh, by the way, my book's available on Amazon, as is my wife's. Uh, my wife wrote a, a book called um, One Woman, Two Lives, uh, The Stories of a Holocaust Survivor. Upon the death of my mother-in-law, my father-in-law found these long unknown journals that she had kept through the years of her journey from Poland and Russia and escaping through Europe and coming here to the United States and starting a family and, you know, the successes she had here in this country. And she wrote uh, these journals, which my wife put into book form and, um, you know, has got it out there. So um, two great things. Uh, anything you want to talk about or promote, uh, James, while you're here? Well, I, 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 and this is about New York City and it's a quote, Al, from your book that, that you just published. It's called, you know, and I don't know if you mentioned the title. I did it on a dare, how I created a, a comedy empire. But the, the quote is, uh, the, the closer you are to a metropolitan area, the better an opportunity you have to make it as a comedian. And I think that is the light at the end of the tunnel for New York City is that ultimately it is the, it is the best metropolitan area in the United States. It's, it's densely packed. And I think that is, 
will always be the best spot to make it in various artistic fields, whether it's comedy or art or writing or whatever. And uh, I, I hope that's always the case. Wow, that's right. great, James. I'm glad that you found a positive note <laughs> to end we, it on. Had, I had to do it for you, Clay. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> let you down. Well, you know, I'm thinking about this. You guys, you know, Al wrote a book. Uh, James, obviously, you wrote a, an article that went viral for one reason or another. Uh, Al's wife and I think James book. has got a book out there, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, I've, I wrote a book during this. It's coming out in February. It's called Skip the Line about how to how to learn any field fast uh, and quickly so you can monetize it. I also put out a, a, a TV series on Amazon called Choose Yourself based on another book I wrote. Terrific. So you're writing books. Al's writing books. Al's wife is writing books. And I'm writing my last will and testament. <laughs> I'm, I'm still here in New York City. Well, James, uh, on behalf of Al, let me just say thank you so much for, for being our guest. We haven't actually recorded a podcast in so long. And this is a really great way to kind of uh, reinvigorate the podcast by, by having you on. So thank well, you. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's, and, and it's good to hang out with you guys. So I miss, yeah, I miss the comedy scene in New York. For sure. We'd love to have you back again. I'll see you at the poker tables down here. Yeah, we got to yeah. fix that up. Yeah, Great. definitely. And maybe we can play some on, online as well. So for, Great. For, for Al Martin and for James Altouche and for our producer, Jay Frank, uh, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Thank guys. you, guys. Hi, Al Martin here owner of the Broadway Comedy Club and Greenwich Village Comedy Club in New York City. And I just authored a great book on stand-up comedy and my 30-year journey called Did It on a Dare, How I Built a Comedy Empire in 30 Short Years. So if you want an interesting story on the comedy scene in the 90s and early 2000s up until the present, if you're an aspiring comic and want to learn about some of my golden rules of comedy from a comedy club owner, this is the book for you. It's available on Amazon. And just go to Amazon, click Al Martin, and it'll take you right to my page. It's available on audio and Kindle, as well as paperback. Thank you.